night of the 24th of August, 2001, a fully loaded Airbus A330 with 306 people on board ran out of fuel midway over the Atlantic. How could a state-of-the-art computerized airliner suffer such a catastrophic failure? Mayday, mayday, mayday. We have lost both engines due to fuel starvation. We are gliding now. Well, we're now at 30,000 feet at the rate of descent of 2,000 feet per minute. We have to ditch in the water. And you didn't put on your life jackets right now? <laughs> this film investigates what happened to Air Transat Flight 236. This is it. This is It's over. They're just going to die in the next five to ten minutes. And the speed's increasing. 203 knots now. It's way too fast. Everybody, I need you to brace. Oh, my God! Oh, no! August 23rd, 2001. Toronto's International Airport is busy. Air Transat is a charter company that has grown rapidly to become one of the largest airlines in Canada. Midsummer brings fewer business travelers and a holiday atmosphere. Air Transat Flight 236 is bound for Lisbon. Most of the passengers are Canadians visiting Europe or Portuguese immigrants heading home. The plane, a twin-engined Airbus A330, is being flown by a young co-pilot, Dirk de Jager, and an experienced captain, Robert Pichet. Captain Robert Pichet is somewhat out of the ordinary. Captain Pichet, from the moment he gets his wing, he gets to learn how to fly in the uh, north of uh, the province of Quebec, where the conditions occasionally are very severe. The flight deck of the A330 is ultra-modern. Banks of computers connected to over a hundred onboard sensors constantly monitor the operation of the plane. This film reveals how serious problems can arise when the pilots get unusual readings from the computers and begin to distrust them. On this night, the computers assist the smooth takeoff of Flight 236. 236 Heavy, follow A320 Air Canada. Turn left on Romeo and hold short on 24 right. Roger, follow A320 Air Canada, left on Romeo and hold short of 24 right. With the crew of 13, Flight 236 has 306 people on board. Zero at eight, cleared for takeoff, two four right, transat, 236 heavy. At 10 minutes past eight, the Airbus A330, loaded with over 47 tons of fuel, left Toronto for Lisbon. V1, rotate. The weather forecast for the Atlantic crossing is good. Everything runs smoothly on the flight deck, apart from a small adjustment to the route. To avoid congestion, air traffic control directs the flight 60 miles south of its original route. It's a minor alteration, but will play a crucial role later. Passengers settle down for the long crossing. Everything appeared quite normal, and in fact, um, I had traveled on Air Transat previously and found it not to be very good, and was surprised by the quality of the flight, that you know, it was on time, the plane was newer, and we thought generally it was much better than we had expected it would be. We're getting to our next checkpoint. Every 30 minutes across the Atlantic, the crew check their position and fuel consumption against their flight plan. 0.2 tons on the right. 
11.2 tons on the left. Despite the computerized systems, some procedures like checking the fuel on board still need to be done by hand. Tons. By comparing the amount of fuel in the tanks with the amount the flight started with, the pilots can keep an eye on their fuel consumption. Fuel check complete. Levels normal for the distance flown. All right. For the first five hours, everything is routine. The flight crew, Air Transat, and accident investigators have all declined to be interviewed about what happened next. This film uses known facts about the flight standard emergency procedures and expert opinion to reconstruct what took place on flight 236. Look, we're getting a warning signal. Oil temp low and oil pressure high on number two. What? This warning is the first step in the crisis. Oil pressure is within normal limits on number one. Number two is slightly high. The computer display reveals that the oil temperature is low in engine number two, but the oil pressure is high. It is a very unusual reading. The pilots are puzzled. I can't see anything here. Huh. I'll look in the FCOM. Okay. A low oil temperature indication is normally in indicative of, of bad readings, and bad sensor. Uh, oil temperatures don't decrease normally, they increase. A low oil temperature would, would be of no concern. The high oil pressure is, uh, is a very strange indication. Uh, it's, it's very rare. In fact, I've never actually heard of one. It's only indicative of the contamination normally of the oil with fuel. Uh, that's not something that's explained in the manuals. Call the company. The crew contact Air Transat's maintenance group in Montreal. Transat 236 to Mirabel Operations. Mirabel Transat 236. Hi. Hi, we have a little problem. We're getting the warning oil temp low and oil pressure high on the ECAM for engine number two. There's nothing in the QRH nor the FCOM. Can you help us out? I'm looking in the manual. The ground crew have no immediate solution. The pilots must work it out themselves. They may have been given some advice uh, on, on troubleshooting uh, to see um, if that would help. But ultimately, uh, you know, the pilots are up there on their own. Uh, you know, they can get advice from somebody 2,500 miles away, but they can't really fix their problems. Suggest you keep monitoring your oil levels and see what happens. But because the oil readings are so unusual, the pilots believe they may indicate a computer error. The crew keep monitoring the oil levels. Air Transat 236 continues on track. Then, 20 minutes later, a new warning. Fuel imbalance warning. Haven't seen that before. Follow all ECAM action. I have air traffic control. In the Airbus 330, most of the fuel is in large tanks in the wings. The computer has now detected that the fuel level on the right is now significantly lower than the left. The crew consults the Airbus flight manual which recommends they transfer fuel through the special cross-feed valve. Fuel will then flow from one tank to the other. But before opening the cross-feed, the pilots must be sure that the imbalance is not caused by a more serious problem, such as a fuel leak. Last fuel check was only 15 minutes ago and it was okay. No indication of a fuel leak. Keep going. Wing cross feed. On. On. Once you begin the cross feeding procedure to correct a fuel imbalance, uh, restorative action should commence quite quickly. Uh, in other words, the situation would not continue to, uh, to get worse. It would, it would either stabilize immediately and then begin to to correct itself. But the situation is not correcting itself. Unknown to the pilots, there is a major fuel leak in the number two engine on the right-hand side of the plane. Flight 
236 is some 300 kilometers from the nearest land in mid-Atlantic. 39,000 feet over the Atlantic, some 300 kilometers from land, Air Transat Flight 236 is in trouble. Unknown to the pilots, the right engine is leaking fuel. The plane's computer system has thrown up a series of warnings, but the pilots believe these are computer errors. Have you ever seen something like this before? Nope. Never. Doesn't make any sense. Hey, even if there is a leak, it doesn't explain the alarms on the oil system. And everything was okay at the last few check at 30 West. Oh, bet you it's a computer problem. The task of finding out if there is a fuel leak is made harder by the design of the Airbus systems. The systems monitor hundreds and hundreds of sensors, and uh, you know they can be affected by uh, you know such mundane things as a little bit of uh, frost or ice on a sensor can can uh, can cause it to pre present bad data. There is no direct warning to show if the fuel level is falling faster than the engines are consuming it. So the pilots receive no immediate indication that there could be a fuel leak. The fuel quantity isn't rising in the tanks for the right wing. Check fuel quantity. Looks very low. Hold on. When co-pilot de Jager carries out the fuel calculations, he discovers something is seriously wrong. It's much less fuel than we should have. It looks like a fuel leak. Check again. De Jager finds a disturbing difference. According to the, all the gauges, all the tanks in the right wing are way below the level they should be according to the flight plan. And, and there's hardly anything in the other ones. What about a trim tank? There's nothing there either. Yes? Hello, first officer here. Can you come to the cockpit, please? Sure. Although Captain Pichet still believes he is dealing with a computer problem, he nevertheless decides to ask for a visual check just in case to see if there could be a fuel leak. Captain? Hi. Can you and Karen uh, take some flashlights and go to the windows if you can see anything trailing back from the wings? It'll look like a mist or a stream and report back immediately. Okay. Great. I want you to do another complete fuel check, please. I'm so sorry. In daylight, the fuel pouring out the back of the wing would have been clearly visible. But in the dead of night, even with a torch, the fuel leaking from the engine is impossible to see. The crew evidently realized that the situation was not improving, and uh, at that point they realized that there's that their circumstances were becoming more serious. And uh, I think that there were probably some discussions took place between the two pilots as to what their next course of action should be. If the computer is correct, then with the amount of fuel remaining, the Airbus will no longer be able to make it to Lisbon. Captain Pichet is forced to divert the flight. We've got to divert. Get on to Oceanic Control, where's the nearest airfield? Transat 236 Heavy Santa Maria Control, can you advise nearest airfield? We have a possible fuel problem. The nearest runway is over 300 kilometers away. With the fuel remaining, Lages military air base on the tiny island of Tercera in the Azores should be within reach. Santa Maria Control, Transat 236 Heavy. Proceed to 30 flight level 390 direct. 350 miles to threshold. Are you declaring an emergency? Stand by, Santa Maria Control. Not yet. It must be the computer. Transat 236 Heavy Santa Maria Control, no assistance required yet. 
Flight 236 continues flying south for the next 25 minutes. Everything in the cabin seems normal. But in the cockpit, the fuel readings are getting worse. Must be the computer. I've checked. There's nothing in the trim or center tank. And the gauges show only seven and a half... According to the fuel gauges, the plane is using fuel much faster than normal. Whether they believe the gauges or not, the captain has no choice. He must warn air traffic control. We have to declare a fuel emergency. Transat 236 Heavy, Santa Maria Control. Santa Maria Control, Transat 236 Heavy, go ahead. Transat 236 Heavy, declaring fuel emergency. I really hope it's a computer bug. Because if we land in the Azores, with half a plane full of fuel, they'll crucify us. But at 6.13 a.m., less than an hour from the first fuel alarm, the full gravity of their situation strikes home. The right-hand engine runs out of fuel and cuts out. We're losing engine number two. I don't believe this. Okay, maximum thrust on number one. What's going on? Uh-oh. Yes. Uh-oh. Yes. Uh-oh. Lights started flickering on and off, which I thought was kind of odd, strange. On one engine, the Airbus will not fly at 39,000 feet. They must descend quickly. Try to transfer fuel from center tank and to trim tank. Transferring. Fuel quantity is reaching zero. This can't be. We're not gonna go completely dry on this airplane. All right, we can't stay at 39,000 feet with just one engine. We'll descend to 33,000 to control our speed. 236 Delages Tower, we have lost one engine, engine flame out. Roger, Transat 236, we can see you on primary radar. You are at 135 nautical miles from Lages Field. We are 135 nautical miles from Lages Field. For the next 10 minutes, the stricken Airbus continues on its one remaining engine. The pilots still believe that the computer may be partly faulty and that they can make it to La Jesse with fuel to spare. At the end, might be all right. Fuel gauge is falling fast, though. It's, it's nearly hitting zero. Thirteen minutes after the right-hand engine cut out, and with 157 kilometers still to go, the left engine begins to fail. We're losing number one. Mayday, mayday, mayday. We have lost both engines due to fuel starvation. We are gliding now. One of the most sophisticated airliners of the modern era, carrying 306 passengers and crew, is now nothing more than a giant glider, drifting steadily down towards the ocean. Excuse me, can somebody come? Um, you can literally hear a pin drop. The, the, the exterior, there was no sound in that plane, in that cabin at all. A lot of people were praying and um, screaming for God. List of functions we've lost. We have no more stabilizer. Your blue and yellow hydraulic. No ADR 2 and 3. No anti-skid. No reversers. Rudder trim. Radio HF 1 and 2. Lost With the loss of both engines, we have no electrical system. If the engines aren't running, the generators aren't running. So there's, there's no power on the airplane. There is a, a small device. It's called a ram air turbine. It will deploy from underneath the fuselage near the wing fairing. And it's, it's, it's a small propeller that deploys out the bottom of the fuselage and it spins in the wind. And that 
The small propeller will provide very limited electrical and hydraulic systems to run the aircraft. In other words, although it's a glider, at least it's a controllable glider. Calculate how far we can go with our glide angle, will you? Well, we're now at 30,000 feet at the rate of descent of 2,000 feet per minute. Oh, we can hang on, hang on for 14 or 15 minutes. What? I don't want to die on our way, man. I was just trying to calm her down, like try and reassure her that everything would be okay. Yeah, it's a very big struggle um, to stay calm when you're considering your own death. Without power, the plane loses 1,000 feet in height for every five kilometers it travels forward. They can reach the Azores, but if the pilots make a mistake, they may face a forced landing on the water. We have to ditch in the water. Air Transat Flight 236 is now drifting without fuel over the Atlantic. Although their initial calculations show that the plane should make it to La Jesse, Captain Pichet must now follow standard emergency procedure in a passenger jet over water. Prepare the cabin. The cabin's slowly depressurizing. We need to put our oxygen masks on. The loss of engine power means the cabin will soon depressurize. your attention. We are preparing to ditch the plane. I need you to put on your life jackets right now. Within probably, I'd say, two minutes, um, I saw flight attendants with life jackets in their hand running down the aisles. And obviously, that was a, a sign of fear. Um, what, you know, what was happening was the first question that popped in my mind. Oh, you just need to tie this up like that. Everybody no, you don't really know what to think. Um, but people did start to panic at that point when they were told to put on life jackets. This is a one no, case, all right? It doesn't it work. Remain, please keep it calm. It's no so My best friend was talking to his father. His father died three years ago. But he was talking to him because he thought for sure he was going to be joining him. Ditching a large passenger jet on the water presents a severe hazard. If the Airbus 330 has to make a forced landing, the chances of survival are bleak. In my personal opinion, I don't think these airplanes would make very good boats. Typically, uh, an airplane with a low-mounted tail like this, as it enters the water, one of the first things that's going to hit the water is the tail, and it's probably going to be ripped right off, and the fuselage is probably going to open right about there. In 1996, a Boeing 767 ran out of fuel off the coast of East Africa. Its last moments were caught on amateur video and reveal what happens when an airliner attempts a controlled landing on water. Of the 175 people on board the Ethiopian Airways jet, only 50 survived. The chances of it surviving a, a ditching and floating for very long are not very good. If Air Transat Flight 236 has to carry out a similar maneuver, it faces an equally grave outcome. With over 100 kilometers before they reach the Azores, the pilots face a long and difficult maneuver. They need to keep the plane gliding for more than 15 minutes to reach the Azores. Transat 236, heavy to Lajes Tower. Lajes Tower receiving Transat 236, heavy. Do you have us on radar, Transat 236? We have you on primary radar. Confirm you're at 80 miles out. Your heading is good. Transat 236 Heavy Lajes Tower, we are trying to make the runway. Please describe runway, heading, and length. 
Blanchett Tower turns at 236 heavy. Runway is 33 and 10,865 feet long. Airport dead ahead on your present heading. Please advise when you have it in sight. Transat 236 Heavy, we cannot see the airport. We will tell you when we can. As the minutes tick by, the long wait for those on board is agonizing. That's it, that's, this is it, this is, it's over. They're just gonna die in the next five to 10 minutes. I had contemplated the idea that we would die. Certainly, and kind of you can. I think in that moment you can accept it more than you think you would accept it. The torture of the whole fact that you're gonna die, which I totally thought I was going to, is worse to me than dying. If I'm gonna die, just kill me now. Just, just get a gun and shoot me, or just let this plane go down and nose dive into the ocean, and then just die instantly. On the ground, emergency services prepare for the crash landing of a fully loaded airliner. With 20 kilometers to go, the crew now prepare for the most dangerous part of the operation, getting their plane on the runway in one piece. Heavy Elijah's Tower, do you have our distance from the threshold now and weather, please? Roger, Transat 236 Heavy. You are eight miles out according to primary radar, airspeed 280 knots according to our reading. Visibility unlimited. You should have the airport in sight. Negative, Elijah's Tower. Until now, we cannot see the runway. There is no room for error. Without power, the pilots have only one chance at landing. If they miss or overshoot the runway, the results could be catastrophic. I got it, just to the right. Minimum rat speed is 140 knots. Maximum speed for gravity gear extension, 200 knots. I'm not lowering the gear until the last minute, okay? Okay. The crew struggle to lose height and speed for landing. Roger, Laja, six nautical miles. Let's open the slats. It'll slow us down a bit. Slats out and locked. As they approach the runway, their speed increases dangerously. Too fast, and they could run off the end of the runway. Lower the gear. Hold on. Speed is about 200. All right. I stabilize the speed. Can you give me a landing speed, please? No engine, no flaps. Ideal approach speed is 170 knots. We're too fast. Yes. But the runway is very long. Captain Pichet now performs a difficult series of swerving maneuvers to slow the plane down for landing. The plane was almost on a like a 45 degree angle. I thought it was just going to just gonna flip over and just nose dive straight down. The plane was circling around the island to slow down. So then we saw land and then we saw water. And when I saw water again, it really struck me that, you know, our chance for survival had maybe was gone. The runway is long. Yeah, sure, but at the end is a 400 foot cliff. If we don't stop in enough time, we're toast. We're dead. crew line up the giant Airbus for the final approach. Line the gear down and locked. Three green. No flaps. Only the emergency brakes. No spoilers. No reverse thrust. 4,000 feet, 195 knots.
3,000 feet, 197 knots. Two thousand feet, two hundred knots. Alert the cabin. Cabin crew, one minute to landing. Oh, hang on. Let's go. Vertical speed at three thousand feet per minute. We're going way too fast, and the speed's increasing. Two hundred three knots now. It's way too fast. 1,000 feet, 201 knots. I'm trying to get the nose up. We'll ride fast. But even if the crew can get the Airbus on the runway, they face a further problem. Without engines, the normal procedures for braking are severely restricted. The danger is far from over. Pilots must land the plane without power and somehow get it to stop. Everybody, I need you to trace. The Airbus hits hard at high speed. The tires have blown! Captain Pichet tries to hold the nose down. After bursting eight tires, the plane finally stops in the middle of the runway. I just wanted to get out of this airplane quickly. I jumped, I hit the ground hard. It's my, I don't think my, my rear end actually even touched the chute at all. I didn't slide down the slide. I ran down it and they're just, get out, get out, get out. So you're just running out of this aircraft. What in God's name just happened? I, I, I fell down to the ground literally and I just started, I started crying. I mean, once you're off the plane and you're evacuated, you want to know what happened. Pichet and de Jager had flown their Airbus without power further than any passenger jet in history. As news of their remarkable achievements spread around the world, they found themselves reluctant heroes. You don't have time really to think about anything else than taking care of the, of the safety of your passenger, you know. That's your main goal, and uh, since we didn't have any engine, the other main goal was to make the landing safely. So at that time, I guess the experience came in, you know, with the help of my colleague, that's why we, that's why we made a successful landing. You train for the worst, but you never know how you'll be, deal with uh, situations like this. And um, reflecting afterwards, I feel uh, we dealt uh, in the most professional and uh, complete wa matter we could. A feeling of being grateful to see all the passengers uh, were okay. You know, something like this happened. You never know what what is going to happen. Really, I mean, you don't. You stop not to believe it. I mean. Uh, Makes no sense that a big jet with two engines has no more power with 300 people on board, you know. But although the public story was of success, disturbing questions remained. Why had a highly sophisticated airliner run out of fuel? What exactly had happened to Flight 236? Away from the cameras, an accident investigation began immediately by the Portuguese, Canadian and French transport authorities. Initial checks quickly confirmed that all the fuel tanks of the Airbus were indeed empty. But to lose more than 17 tons of fuel in such a short space of time meant they had a major leak. The question was where? 
Engineers examined the fuel system, searching for faults in the tanks and the fuel lines. It wasn't long before they found what they were looking for, just by the right engine. In this particular case, you had a hydraulic tube that's relatively small by comparison to the larger fuel tube. And the hydraulic tube, due possibly to pulsations in the hydraulic system, were abrading against the larger tube and eventually the larger tube uh, had a leak in it and the leak, or not the leak itself, but the, uh, the hole eventually possibly led into a fracture of the tube allowing this massive fuel flow outside of the engine. The investigators began checking Air Transat maintenance records. They discovered that on the 19th of August, five days before the flight, Air Transat had removed the right-hand engine for maintenance and installed a replacement unit sent by Rolls-Royce. But as they analyzed the repair logs for the engine, they uncovered a shocking mistake. This was not a case of faulty design, but of faulty maintenance. Rolls-Royce had supplied the engine without a hydraulic pump assembly. To overcome this, Transat mechanics had used the parts from an older engine. But they didn't fit properly, and the pipes had been rubbing together for five days. Until midway over the Atlantic, one finally broke. The engine was delivered minus these two tubes and a bracket. That The purpose of that bracket was to maintain adequate clearance. So if they took the bracket off the old engine and put it on the new engine, is that the pipes would be locked together so that they could possibly abrade. As investigators questioned Air Transat mechanics, they found more disturbing evidence of malpractice. The chief mechanic testified that he had been concerned about the substitution of another hydraulic assembly. Five days before the accident, he raised his concerns with his superior. The company decided that the aircraft must go back into service and could not wait for the missing parts. He should go ahead with the substitution. The replacement parts only differed from the correct ones by a few millimeters, but it was a difference that nearly cost 306 lives. A few days after the accident, Air Transat publicly accepted responsibility for the faulty maintenance. We have to realize that there was a small uh, a mistake uh, made uh, in terms of changing the pump. Uh, we installed it, uh, but then uh, some 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 uh, pipes, uh, so to speak, uh, were needed to be connected to the pump, and there was a mismatch. The immediate consequences for Air Transat in that event was that they got to pay a fine of a quarter of a million dollars, which was the highest ever in Canada, for an error that could have been prevented. How someone that is supposed to be qualified in their job can put the wrong part onto an engine and risk 300 people's lives is, is, is beyond me. This incident is a very strong reminder that regulation is important and safety is important and lives will be lost in the absence of that. And they're real lives. It's not just, you know, this imaginary figure in your head of 300 people. It's real people who suffer and continue to suffer. As a result. If it hadn't been us suffering, it would have been our families. This was by no means the end of the story. Investigators now turned their attention to the cockpit itself. And what role had the crew played in the events of August 24th? Could they have done more to avert the crisis? Key questions remained unanswered. Questions about what happened on the flight deck. The Transport Canada investigation into Air Transat Flight 236 discovered that basic maintenance errors had led to the fuel leak. Air Transat had accepted responsibility and were heavily fined. 
But the focus now turned on the flight deck and the performance of the crew. What part did they play in the fuel loss? Wing cross feed. On. On. When the crew opened the cross feed valve to transfer fuel from the left wing tank to the right, they lost 17 tons of fuel in less than 30 minutes. Yet they failed to close the cross feed valve and prevent further loss. We have lost both engines due to fuel starvation. We are gliding now. In the days after the incident, Captain Robert Pichet and Dirk de Jager were called before the inquiry and asked in detail about their actions. More than two years later, these findings have still not been published. What follows are possible explanations for the course of events that night, based on known facts and expert opinion. Oil temp low and oil pressure high on number two. The warnings of high oil pressure and low oil temperature from the number two engine on the right wing would not have led the pilots to suspect there was already a major fuel leak. The indications that were being presented uh, with respect to the oil system would probably not give the crew any indications. Uh, um, they may have questioned what was causing uh, the the erroneous or strange indications, uh, but uh, there's nothing certainly in, in my mind or their training I think that would have uh, triggered them to suspect that uh, you know a fuel system might be involved. Bet you it's a computer problem. But although the pilots thought they had a computer error, the oil warnings were actually correct and were the first indication of a much more serious problem. Imbalance warning. I haven't seen that before. When the fuel imbalance warning came up 20 minutes later, showing less fuel in the right wing than the left, it seemed unconnected with the oil alarms. This could have reinforced Captain Pichet's idea that he was facing a series of computer errors. Do not apply this procedure if a fuel leak is suspected. Despite his doubts, Captain Pichet was obliged to follow Airbus procedure to correct the imbalance. He opened the cross feed valve. Wing cross feed. On. But was following the checklist enough? You just can't uh, you know, idly flip switches in response to commands from the computers and anticipate that all will be well at the end of it. You know, once the checklist is complete, uh, we can sit there fat, dumb, and happy. Uh, that's not the case uh, at all. You know, you you, you got to keep second guessing it. You know, is that right? Did we do the right checklist? Have we got the results that we need? Once the pilots calculated the high rate of fuel loss, they should have suspected a fuel leak. Transat 236 Heavy declaring fuel emergency. By the time they had confirmed the leak, their options were severely limited. Now they had a choice. Uh, do I close the cross feed and, uh, and see what happens? Or do I leave the cross feed open as, as the, as the uh, fuel and balance checklist has, has dictated? and maybe the situation will correct itself. The, the crew wasn't really sure. Captain Pichet believed for a long time that he was facing a computer error. It was only when the engine stopped that he had to accept the fuel leak was genuine. The technological complexity of modern aircraft can help to make them safer and more reliable, but it can also lead to problems that nearly brought catastrophe to Air Transat 236. Discrepancies in replacement parts led to a fuel leak. Distrust of computers led the crew to misread the situation. These errors have huge implications. Only because air traffic control initially sent the plane 60 miles south to avoid congestion was it close enough to the Azores when the crisis struck. Otherwise, it would have had to ditch in the ocean. The Portuguese investigation remains unpublished. Airbus blames the pilots for mishandling the fuel leak. Robert Pichet and Dirk de Jager continue to fly with Air Transat. In August 2002, they received one of the highest honors of the Airline Pilots Association for the longest glide ever accomplished in a passenger airliner. After the accident, Airbus modified its checklist in the event of fuel imbalance. From now on, the computer checks all fuel levels on board against the flight plan. 
It now gives a clear warning if more fuel is being lost than the engines can consume. Rolls-Royce has reissued a service bulletin alerting all its clients of the incompatibility of two almost similar parts. Whatever the circumstances are, um, the pressure that he was under is tremendous. He, he got that plane down safely, only blew out eight of the 12 tires <laughs> and saved 300 people. He saved 300 people's lives. Captain Pichet saved our lives and um, whether or not he made an error um, or if there was a failure of a computer, it doesn't really matter because we're alive. <laughs> Do I think he's a hero? No. Do I think he's a hell of a pilot? Yes. Thank God the islands of the Azores were there and basically saved our lives. But if that fuel pump uh, broke two, five minutes beforehand, we'd, we would have ended up into, into the water and I probably wouldn't be here to tell the story.